What is up, my good friends? How is life treating you today? Hope everything is fine and dandy and you're all having a swell week. So, recently, it came to my attention that a dude named Leo in Longevity collaborated with another YouTuber named Tony Huge to do a video on what they call a deep dive into finasteride side effects. Now, I am familiar with Leo in Longevity as he is a very popular figure in the online manosphere of self-improvement, and honestly, despite my occasional disagreements with him, I still nevertheless like his content. I haven't heard of Tony Huge before, but I do appreciate how he seems to be open about his gear use, and I of course have nothing against people who choose to use performance enhancing drugs, provided they're not using them for an unethical purpose such as cheating in a sport. So in a sense, I feel some chivalry with Leo since what he does on his channel is similar to what I do on my own channel, even though he covers a broader array of subjects. One key difference between us though is that Leo often doesn't just examine the scientific data, he'll go so far as to use himself as a guinea pig effectively for many of the treatments that he recommends on his channel. Now, a case study, even when performed on yourself, is not going to be as strong a form of of scientific evidence as a randomized controlled trial, obviously, but I still admire his commitment to science and to his viewers by trying these things out on himself before he recommends them on his channel. So. I know that Leo has given his opinions about finasteride on his channel before, and I know he's not anti-finasteride by any stretch of the imagination, but he does nevertheless promote some views about the drug's adverse effects, which I don't think are really justified due to the lack of scientific evidence. I'm not creating this video, though, to saber-rattle with Leo about my disagreements over finasteride, because I don't think it is necessary, since I already have plenty of videos on my channel in which I discuss issues where Leo and I may have some contentions, like with neurosteroids and post-finasteride syndrome. As many of you guys already know, I do not believe that post-finasteride syndrome is a real condition, and I also do not believe finasteride has any harmful effects on neurosteroids or on the brain. On the contrary, I think the opposite is true, and I'll post my video series on neurosteroids and post-finasteride syndrome below if you want to better understand my position on those subjects. I also appreciate how Leo acknowledges many of the problems that DHT causes. This is important because there is a real toxic subset in the manosphere community where people act like DHT is some sort of essential alpha male hormone and that there is no way to suppress it without compromising your virility. If you want to see a real specific example of that, then you should check out part two and part three of my DHT is a trash hormone video series where I respond to Hans Amato, who is perhaps the world's biggest DHT simp of all time. Now, of course, I know the online manosphere and the intellectual dark web are trying to protect the male gender from the horror of woke culture, feminazis, SJWs, and all the other stuff neckbeards like to bitch about, but it doesn't help their cause to call men pussies when they want to use finasteride, since 5-AR inhibitors like finasteride are to date the only scientifically proven way to stop hair loss in the long term. So, in this video with Tony Huge, Leo covers a lot of territory and he has a very impressive knowledge of human physiology. He presents a lot of information in a very rapid fire fashion. He doesn't quote any scientific studies, but that's not surprising since this is an interview and not a video he made up himself. The setup for this video is that Tony Huge is someone who wants to take finasteride for his hair loss, but he doesn't know what can be done to mitigate potential finasteride side effects. Like I said, Leo is not anti-finasteride, but he believes that finasteride is responsible for three major side effects. The first side effect he mentions is anxiety. The second side effect is brain fog, which is a non-medical term used to describe symptoms related to cognitive decline like mental confusion and or overall sluggish mental functioning. Finally, he mentions sexual dysfunction, which he thinks is a combination of both physical and mental factors. So like I said, Leo is not making this video to fearmonger about finasteride. Rather, he's trying to offer solutions to what he feels are the drug shortcomings by providing ways to mitigate the drug side effects, even the hypothetical side effects. His goal is to encourage, not discourage, the use of finasteride. Now, other than sexual dysfunction, which is rare, I do not think finasteride causes these other mental side effects like anxiety or brain fog, but... I do know, nevertheless, there are always going to be people who, can, who will disagree with me on this, so if Leo can offer some solutions that help people feel more confident about taking finasteride, then all the better, because finasteride is, after all, a lifelong commitment, or at least it is until something better comes along. So I'm not making this video to, to dispute Leo's conclusions about finasteride side effects. There are already plenty of other videos on my channel where I talk about things like neurosteroids and post-finasteride syndrome, and they are all linked in the video description, so feel free to 
look at those videos and draw your own conclusions, if you will. So, instead of disputing these neurological side effects that Leo believes in, I'd rather play devil's advocate here and just assume for the purposes of this video that Leo is right, and that finasteride really does have the potential to cause harm the way Leo implies. If that's true, will the solutions really help finasteride users, and if not, are there any other solutions for mitigating finasteride side effects? Let's go balls deep and find out, my friends. Well, Leo starts out by addressing the neurosteroid issue up front. People who are worried about the neurological side effects from finasteride love to talk about a specific neurosteroid called allopregnanolone. Remember, progesterone is converted into allopregnanolone the same way testosterone is converted into DHT. And the reason is, is that allopregnanolone is synthesized from the hormone progesterone, and one of the enzymes involved in its synthesis is the 5-alpha reductase, or 5-AR enzyme, which is the same enzyme that converts testosterone into DHT, and it's the enzyme finasteride suppresses. Allopregnanolone modulates a certain neurotransmitter in the brain called GABA. It's not that important to get into the details, but allopregnanolone tends to have a calming effect on the brain, sort of like the drug Xanax, and Leo goes into some detail about how allopregnanolone works in the brain. So, Leo recognizes that finasteride would have less effect on neurosteroids than dutasteride, so he recommends oral finasteride over oral dutasteride because he fears dutasteride will totally totally shut down allopregnanolone synthesis. He doesn't say it, but he implies that finasteride would have less effect than dutasteride because it is a weaker 5 air blocker. There's actually more to it than that, though. Finasteride is predominantly a blocker of the type 2 5AR isoenzyme, while dutasteride blocks both the type 1 and type 2 5AR isoenzymes. This is an important distinction because the variant of the 5AR isoenzyme in the brain is the type 1 isoenzyme, so finasteride should have little or no effect on allopregnanolone synthesized in the brain at all, since finasteride only suppresses one one hundredth of the amount of type 1 5AR isoenzyme compared to dutasteride. I go over this in more detail in the videos that I'll link below, but what about dutasteride? Since it is a type 1 and type 2 isoenzyme blocker, will it really, as he says, wipe out your allopregnanolone levels? But if you're taking dutasteride, which inhibits 5 alpha reductase type 1 and type 2 both strongly, you can't convert anything to progesterone to allopregnol. Well, you might think so based on its type 1 isoenzyme blocking effect, but surprisingly, the answer is actually no. Dutasteride has actually been studied as a treatment for what's called premenstrual dysphoric syndrome. In the study of women who had this syndrome, dutasteride at the usual dose given for treating hair loss, namely 0.5 milligrams per day, had no effect on serum allopregnanolone levels or on any of these women's symptoms. The symptoms we are talking about were irritability, anxiety, and sadness. So the usual dose of dutasteride had no effects on symptoms or even on serum allopregnanolone levels at all, which indicates there was no effect on brain neurosteroids. However, on high doses of dutasteride, specifically 2.5 milligrams per day, which is sometimes used for hair loss as part of a nuclear stack, allopregnanolone levels did decrease. And not only that, anxiety, irritability, and depression actually got better, interestingly enough. So this study shows that even though dutasteride theoretically should have more effect on neurosteroids than finasteride, since it is a type 1 5 air isoenzyme blocker, the usual dose of dutasteride at 0.5 milligrams daily doesn't even affect allopregnanolone levels or affect neurological symptoms at all. Only at a mega dose of 2.5 milligrams per day of dutasteride do we see a minor decrease of serum allopregnanolone levels. But contrary to expectations, symptoms like anxiety and depression didn't get worse on dutasteride, they got better. So changes in allopregnanolone levels don't necessarily even lead to anxiety and other neurological side effects that Leo is concerned about. In any case, Leo's solution to this alleged problem is to use oral finasteride plus topical dutasteride. He says that topical dutasteride, for some reason, doesn't go systemic, while topical finasteride does. Topical dutasteride, oddly, doesn't go systemic that well. Well, He's right about topical finasteride going systemic. It is easily absorbed through the skin. That's why finasteride tablets are coated. It is to prevent finasteride from being absorbed through the skin of women who accidentally handle the tablets. This is important to remember because finasteride can cause birth defects. So if just touching a tablet could cause enough finasteride to be absorbed into the skin and cause birth defects, it is pretty clear that spraying topical finasteride in your scalp is also going to go systemic. And I made a video on this, which I'll link below. Unfortunately, 
Topical dutasteride isn't a very effective treatment since it doesn't get absorbed into the skin very well. That is why it is often given as an injection into the scalp, which is called mesotherapy, or it is given experimentally in specifically designed nanospheres, and I talked about both of these methods in videos I'll link below, but the bottom line from all that is that topical dutasteride, regardless of how it is administered, isn't nearly as effective as oral dutasteride or even oral finasteride. So what Leo says about topical dutasteride not being absorbed systemically systemically is probably true, but it probably also isn't very well absorbed into the scalp either, meaning it is probably useless to add it to oral finasteride since it won't do anything oral finasteride won't already do better. We also know that different 5-AR inhibitors used together don't work synergistically. They don't have any kind of benefit when used together. Like for instance, if you were to combine oral finasteride and oral dutasteride, you won't get any additional DHT suppression compared to just using dutasteride alone. Oral finasteride by itself is powerful enough to stop hair loss in the vast majority of people who use it, and adding topical dutasteride, which isn't very well absorbed, isn't likely to be any more beneficial than oral finasteride alone. But Derek from More Place More Days told me before that it seems that finasteride has very similar effects at like a less than a half milligram dose as a full one milligram dose. Leo then mentions that Derek from More Plates More Dates, also known as the Delt Lord, said that 0.5 milligrams of finasteride works about as well as one milligram per day. And that's all true. Finasteride is not very dose dependent, and I went over the optimal dose of finasteride in a prior video linked in the description. The point I'm making here though, is that it is very easy to titrate finasteride's dosing in order to minimize the potential for side effects while still at the same time maintaining good scalp CHD suppression. And this is a very common thing doctors recommend to their patients who don't respond well to one milligram of finasteride as a way to mitigate finasteride's already very low risk of side effects. That being said, you probably don't want to begin from a position of even a minor compromise. Start with the standard one milligram per day dose and only consider titrating down if you don't respond very well, which is unlikely. The other thing you could do, which is the right approach in my opinion, especially for somebody on dutasteride, and has been very successful with the many clients that I've, I've talked to repeatedly, even with people with post finasteride syndrome, is taking a drug called sodium valproate, which I mentioned many times. He brings up sodium valproate here as a treatment for anxiety, and he mentions it several times in the video, including saying it might help with post finasteride syndrome. He claims that sodium valproate reverses epigenetic changes from finasteride and also affects the GABA transmitter that is controlled by neurosteroids. He says that sodium valproate makes your brain sort of like a sink for GABA. It's also a HDAC inhibitor, thus reversing epigenetic changes. Now, sodium valproate, also known as valproic acid, what it is, it is an anti-seizure medication that is also used to treat bipolar disorder. Like I said, Leo mentions that valproate affects GABA and also affects epigenetic changes, which are reversible changes to gene expression caused by the environment or aging or other factors. He feels the effects on epigenetics might counteract post finasteride syndrome. However, the effects of valproate acid on GABA and on epigenetics are really just based on rodent studies at this point, like this one right here, which shows the effects on GABA, as well as this one here, which is on its effects on epigenetics. And even though this is all interesting, the problem with all this is that there is no evidence that these effects are linked to finasteride side effects. Also, sodium valproate has a long list of side effects, longer than the list of side effects from finasteride by far. Even even worse than that, sodium valproate by itself can cause hair loss, as you can see in this report of three patients with valproate-induced hair loss, including this 40-year-old woman whose hair loss reversed after stopping the drug. So I cannot recommend using sodium valproate unless you have a seizure disorder or a bipolar disorder, and that's something you can talk about with your doctor, of course. It is not a safe drug for anyone else. The next thing we could talk about is brain fog. Leo next moves on to the dreaded brain fog that everybody likes to hype up. Interestingly enough, though, he says that this brain fog is not due to allopregnanolone or GABA, but rather it is due to a reduction in dopamine signaling. Now, there is evidence in rodent models that finasteride can affect the actions of the neurotransmitter dopamine in the brain, but this does not seem to be an effect mediated by DHT. Instead, it appears to be an indirect effect mediated by neurosteroid levels, as noted in this 2021 review article on neurological effects of 5-AR blockers that I'll link below. This is important because the effects of finasteride on brain neurosteroids in rodents is much different than it is from humans. Specifically, finasteride in rodents 
difference is a potent inhibitor of both the type 1 and type 2 5-AR isoenzyme, unlike in humans where finasteride predominantly affects the type 2 enzyme and has virtually no effect on the type 1 5-AR enzyme at all. Moreover, in rodent studies, finasteride had opposite effects on the two different types of dopamine receptors called DA1 and DA2, and the effects were different in rats versus mice. The authors of this review article noted that, quote, it is noteworthy that the expression of two subfamilies of DA receptors differed between species, unquote. So the two species they are talking about are rats and mice. We know that there are even greater differences in the brain and drug effects between humans and rodents. So the bottom line is that these effects of finasteride on dopamine in the human brain aren't established by any means. It's not even clear that dopamine levels are what cause so-called brain fog to begin with, so even though this analysis is interesting, it is all speculative. Leo then mentioned several drugs like Welbutrin and Ritalin for treating brain fog. Now, I know about Ritalin because I went to high school back in the 1990s, and back then, about 90% of all teenagers were prescribed Ritalin, and basically, what these drugs are, they are stimulants. They are going to make you more cognitively alert no matter what you do. Hell, probably a triple shot of espresso would give you a similar effect, but there is no evidence that finasteride causes brain fog, so there is no point in taking a drug to counteract a side effect that doesn't even exist. The last side effect he brings up is sexual dysfunction. Now, there is no doubt that 5-AR inhibitors can sometimes cause sexual dysfunction. We know this because this is one of the side effects reported in the drug's clinical trials, but the incidence of sexual dysfunction is very, very low, usually just a couple percentage points higher than the incidence of sexual dysfunction in the placebo group. Leo states that there are two kinds of sexual dysfunction, either a physical problem with the function of the penis or a mental problem. His belief is that applying androgens directly to the penis may help the physical problem, though he correctly states that applying DHT cream isn't a good idea since DHT will go systemic and worsen hair loss. He thinks testosterone gel might work, however. At least both Tony and Leo agree that injecting testosterone to your gonads is a bad idea. I've heard of people injecting testosterone in or around their gonads, and maybe this is one of the reasons they're doing it. That sounds like a terrible idea for me, but you could see where it comes from. So what Leo is basically saying here is that in order to treat a very rarely occurring side effect of finasteride, you should effectively go on TRT. Applying a testosterone gel to your penis will still absorb systemically and get into the body, effectively putting you on testosterone replacement therapy. Now, that may not be a problem if you're already using testosterone supplements for bodybuilding or you're on testosterone replacement therapy, but that's not the majority of people who have hair loss. I don't know about you guys, but the thought of going on TRT to combat a very rare side effect of finasteride seems pretty draconian, especially since any potential erectile issues you get from finasteride can easily be solved just through the use of a PDE5 inhibitor like Cialis, which you can use at a low dose daily. In addition to giving you better boners, Cialis also has other health benefits as well, like improving prostate health, and it may even raise testosterone levels. So that seems like it would be a much more reasonable solution than going on TRT. Looking back around 10 years ago, drug companies were pushing treatments for what they called low T using some pretty lame commercials, I have to admit. But these drugs were withdrawn because the risk of taking TRT for people with low normal or minimally low testosterone levels far outweighed any benefits. Leo then talks about problems with sex drive that originate in the brain and blames these problems on changes in oxytocin and dopamine levels in the brain. He mentions that you can't take dopamine as a treatment because dopamine causes neurological problems. In fact, he doesn't mention this, but finasteride may be a good treatment treatment for the neurological problems that occur when taking dopamine to treat Parkinson's disease. So he doesn't have any specific solution here, he just recommends taking more testosterone, which again seems to be a pretty radical solution compared to just adding something benign like Cialis. And that's pretty much the whole video. So. Even though I do respect Leo and I appreciate what he is trying to do here by providing strategies to help reduce finasteride side effects, I nevertheless worry that he's making things worse for a few reasons. The first problem is that very commonly when someone has a side effect from finasteride, it isn't really a side effect. It is a nocebo effect. We know this because there is research showing that when people are informed about finasteride side effects before taking the treatment, then they are much, much more likely to have these side effects. In fact, 
In this famous study where one group of people was informed of possible finasteride sexual side effects and one group wasn't, the incidence of sexual side effects actually tripled in the group that were expecting possible sexual side effects. And in that study, patients were just given a list of possible side effects. They weren't submitted to repeated online fear-mongering present on hair loss forums, so one can only imagine how much stronger this nocebo effect is under real-life circumstances, especially these age where basically 99% of all content online about finasteride is fear-mongering. Another problem is that a lot of the drugs Leo proposes to treat finasteride side effects have even more side effects than finasteride itself. With a few exceptions, like treating sexual dysfunction with Cialis, in general, it is a bad idea to treat a drug's side effects with more drugs. The number of side effects from combinations of drugs only increases exponentially. Using drugs like sodium valparate or Ritalin, or even using TRT to treat finasteride's very low risk of side effects is really complete overkill and it is not worth the risk. So you may be thinking right now, but Kevin, if Leo's suggestions don't help, then what can you actually do to reduce finasteride side effects? Well, there is an answer to that. The solution is to stop fucking worrying about it. Just take it like an aspirin and forget about it. Like I said, people who are worried about side effects are more likely to experience side effects. If you take finasteride and are very anxious about having side effects, you are much more likely to get side effects. Furthermore, even if you do get side effects, you should push through them because the majority of times side effects will go away on their own even with continued use. In this review article on finasteride sexual side effects, most studies reviewed show that sexual side side effects disappear with continued use of the drug in the majority of patients on finasteride. Yet oftentimes we see people who will drop the drug the moment they get any side effects at all when all the evidence suggests that these sides would likely go away if they just muscled through them for a few more months. The fact is, is that contrary to what a lot of people claim online, nobody knows what causes finasteride side effects, so there is no medical intervention which is confirmed to reduce the risk of side effects besides just lowering the dose. The side effects people claim they get from finasteride, like anxiety, erectile dysfunction, depression, etc., are all very common conditions that affect a large percentage of men, especially men with hair loss. What is likely happening is that these people who claim finasteride did all these horrible things to them already had these problems, and they they just took them for granted until they had a convenient scapegoat with finasteride. So like I said, I do appreciate Leo's goal here, and his knowledge of various drug mechanisms is very impressive, but I still think this is complete overkill. Just take your finasteride like you take a daily vitamin pill, then forget about it and get on with your life. Going on finasteride isn't like going on chemotherapy. It is a drug that lowers DHT by suppressing the 5-AR enzyme. That is it. Like any other drug in existence, it has a small incidence of side effects, but all the research shows that both the mental and physical health benefits of suppressing the trash hormone DHT far outweigh any of the risk. So please, don't turn your body into a walking pharmacy full of drugs to counteract some hypothetical side effects from finasteride like brain fog and post-finasteride syndrome that don't even exist. Just take the pill, forget about hair loss, and enjoy a life free from the slaphead curse forever. God bless and thank you for watching.